Good evening. Thank you for joining us for tonight's Inspiration webinar. Inspiration Software is the embroidery software line of G7 Solutions and Designs and Machine Embroidery. Our Inspiration line includes My Block Piecer, My Quilt Embellisher, Perfect Embroidery Pro, and Perfect Stitch Viewer. Tonight's webinar features our Perfect Embroidery Pro and Design Analysis. We have a wonderful team assisting us tonight. Dory, manager of the technical support, and that would be me. We have Nancy R., Chris L., and of course we have a new member, longtime family member of our um, Dime family. Her name is Catherine Artinas, and she is going to be with us going forward. Catherine, Catherine is the author of several books and many articles in designs and machine embroidery, and she loves to play with Perfect Embroidery Pro. So, without any further ado, digitize away, Catherine. Thank you so much, Dory. And yes, indeed, I do love to play with Perfect Embroidery Pro. Um, tonight, we're going to be taking a look at the features in the software that let us learn more about a design before stitching it out how working with the click to stitch feature helps with that understanding and also to play a bit as you look at my screen it may look different from yours I have done the January update to version 8.27 if you need to know what version you have you can click up here on help and about and right there will tell you the version number. Should you need help to do that update, you certainly can go to the forum and they have all the information you need there to help you with that update. As you look at some of the changes of this new version, right away you might notice that all of the buttons have a smoother look to them. Way down here at the end we have a buttonhole feature. If we come over here to the text design button, you'll see that monogram designs, motif shapes, applique shapes have been uh, placed under this as a drop-down menu. And then also under our select tool, we would find the lasso. So those are some of the new um, changes to this version. OK. We are going uh, yes. One moment. One moment. Give us a second to get onto your screen because the poll got stuck. OK. All right. Thank you very much for all those people that were nice enough to tell us. There you go. You want to make sure that your screen is on, please? There you go. Right. Is everybody on? No screen yet. And just let me know when you'd like me to continue, Dory. I would like you to um, change over the screen to me. Yes. All right. One moment, please, if everybody will be patient. We will have the screen back to you. Sorry for the poll. Go ahead. Catherine, go ahead. All set. All right, so what we're going to begin with, um, once again, those of you that may not have had your screen available, uh, one of the most obvious things to notice about my screen is the smoother look to all of these buttons. We are going to begin with a little review, so those of you who consider yourself an intermediate or advanced user, do bear with me. If you hang with me throughout, we'll be putting together a fun in the hoop felt tray with the new buttonhole tool at the end of the webinar. Uh, we're going to start and going to come up here with File Open, something you are all familiar with. I have a heart that we're going to work with in honor of upcoming Valentine's Day. I'm going to come over here to my toolbar on the lift, left and click on the 3D so that you can see those stitches. And um, this is one of the free designs that you have under the Perfect Embroidery Pro Free Designs folder. So it is available to everyone. I left it with the file name that it has under that folder. It is a number, so you could go looking for that. Uh, all the things that we do this evening, you can go get this particular design and play with it when you uh, rewatch the webinar. So at okay. this point, 
Catherine, I, I hate yes. to interrupt you again, but we still can't see your screen. Cannot see my screen? No, we cannot see your screen. So if you would be so kind as to um, give it back to me, let me go ahead and see what I can do. All right. I have turned off the poll, but the poll won't turn off. So try it again, Catherine, and please check your screen. Whatever you see, we're seeing, and we're not seeing your screen. I actually do see my screen. Um, Everybody else see the screen or is it just me? Okay. Nobody's answering me. All right. Okay. Please go on, Catherine. Okay. Um, I did go under that file open and open our heart. One of the things that I want to share with you, since I am new to most of you, a little explanation of my procedure. When I say click on, I will always mean a normal click with your left mouse button. If I need you to do a right click, I will say right click on such and such or right click within such and such. For example, if I click normally to select my heart and then I do a right click, I will indicate that I'm doing a right click. I know some moderators out there do indicate a left click every single time they click, but just to get you comfortable with things that you will hear from me. I have heard over and over, I never know whether to left or right click. So here is the explanation for choosing. The only time you use a right click is to access a hidden shortcut menu for the object that you have selected. That's it. It's the original reason and the only reason that we were given a right click to access this hidden menu. Uh, about 98% of all of these commands that you see anywhere on a right mouse click are going to be located either under your menu bar or somewhere on a toolbar. For example, we take a look right here and we see cut, copy, paste, duplicate, insert, delete. If I were to come over here and click on edit, I see all of those same choices right here under my drop-down menu. If I come over here and right-click again and I rest on convert to and I see manual and run and seal and all the types of stitches that we can apply to uh, the design, if I were to come under tools, digitizing, we see all of those things listed right there. So again, a right-click is meant to be a shortcut for you to get to certain commands that are specific to the area that you have selected. All right, so as we have opened this design, you may remember that I started with a file open. And in doing so, this is the original design that is open. If I were to click on, uh, to give myself a new screen, and then I come over here to my uh, library, I can see I currently have my January folder on. This is a folder that I have created so I can be efficient and get the designs I need. But if I were to click on this heart and drag it over and drop it right on the screen, that is a secondary way that I can get that design on my screen. I'm going to click over here on the 3D button so that you can see the stitches. And let's take a look at the differences here. In this design, where I just dragged over and dropped it on the screen, if you look down here on my tab, it does not have a file name yet. It is just telling us that we're in design number two. If I go and click on this first tab, this is the design that I did a file open with, and we are in the original design with the file name down here. So you have options in how to get your design, but depending on how you get it, will also determine what you're doing with it or how you're saving it or are you altering the original design. Some of the things that we can learn right off the bat about this particular design, if we come up here on the very top bar, we see indeed that we are in Perfect Embroidery Pro software. We see the name of the file itself with the format. It is a C2S format. We see Catherine? the total yes. Could you please click uh, showing, I want to show my screen, please.
I did. Sure. Thank you. Go ahead. All right. So if we take a look up here at this top bar, once again, the name of the file, the number of stitches, total 6803, the colors in this design 7, the width is 2.7, the height is 2.6. So yes, we see that information up there, but we can also gather some other information based on what we see here. Based on the width and the height of the design, we can tell right away what size hoop we need. This design is going to fit into a 4x4 four four hoop. Um, if we take a look at the stitches, the stitch count is 6803. What I have done over the years is I just developed a little formula, if you will, always based on 10,000 stitches. If I have a design, 10,000 stitches, and I'm stitching on my embroidery machine at, say, 350 stitches per minute, that 10,000 stitches will take me approximately a half an hour. If I'm stitching out at 600 stitches per minute, that 10,000 stitches will take me approximately 15 minutes. With that little bit of formula right there, based on 10,000 stitches, I can always give myself a guesstimate of how long this particular design will take for me to stitch out. At 6,800, if I stitch it out at 600 stitches per minute, that's going to take about seven minutes for this to stitch out. So it's just a quick reference for myself. It's nothing scientific. It doesn't have to be absolutely accurate. But I can tell, do I have enough time before I have to cook dinner to stitch this particular design out? So right up there, we get a lot of information about the design. We know that it has seven colors. We see those colors listed down here now on the thread color toolbar. And if you were to rest on any one of those colors, you will see right below here on the status bar what the name of that color is, the color number, and so forth. So you can tell a little bit more here. If I come to my library window and change over to the sequence view, I can see those seven colors listed and I also see the order of how this design will stitch out based on those portions. If I click on the plus sign and I now click on the satin portion of this heart, I can come up into the properties window and see that it is a standard to Tommy fill, the stitch length, the density, and so forth. If I walk across those tabs, I can see that this particular heart has no underlay um, specific to the heart, to the, to the fill stitch part of it. I can see the um, uh, defaults that are listed there. If I walk through all of those tabs, I can see the other information about this portion of the design. The last one is something we use often, this transfer, uh, transform tab. We can see how large that part of the design is. We see we have a satin stitch, and or, uh, that part of the heart is a one 1.8, 1.9 in measurement. So we could continue to click. I could um, close that and expand on my satin stitch down here at the bottom. And if I scroll down and click on the satin portion of it, actually I'll just click on the, the title itself, I can see that that part of the design is a satin stitch. So forth. So we get information about the design. However, we are sewists, we are embroiderers, we are visual people. We really like to see what's going on. So we have the uh, slow redraw button offered to us. As we click on that, we are given uh, an additional bar that gives us information right off the top. We see those seven thread uh, colors that we have going. We have the ability to do a next stitch or a previous stitch, and then the ability to start the simulation. Because what's going to happen here, once I click on that button, the design is going to stitch out exactly as it's going to stitch out on your machine. So we watch this simulation of stitching, and we can tell quite a bit about the design as it stitches out. We already saw that the designer had put in a manual underlay for us with both uh, directions of the diagonal. If I were to come up here as it is doing all of this complex fill stitch and drag my speed bar, it speeds up a bit, so it's going to be, go across there. And I could, oops, I could also click on my bar 
and drag it across if I want to go through that area quickly and then begin it again so that I can start to see how these inner hearts are stitched out. As you look at these hearts, notice that they have no underlay that's going down. A little bit of underlay uh, for our arrow and our feather. We then see the gold rod that is stitching out. And in just a moment, we see how the satin stitch will play out first one side and then the other. So you can tell a lot about the design by watching it stitch out in your slow redraw. Not only is it helpful to see how the design was digitized, but we also can ask ourselves, is this design appropriate for our project? Perfect Embroidery Pro gives us a great feature to help us have that design be perfect for its intended use. And that feature is called click to stitch. If we click up here on file and we come down here to click to stitch, it is going to allow us um, to modify the design so that it becomes uh, perfect for us to stitch out on a chosen fabric. The fabric box appears. We have to answer the question of which type of fabric are we using. Well, we talked about a linen, linen napkin. If we come down, we see the long list of fabric types that are offered for us. CAP happens to be the default because it's first in line alphabetically. That's the only reason. And if we are looking for linen, we see that there's actually two kinds. Right here we have a handkerchief linen, and then down two we have a dress weight linen. Well, we're going to pretend that for our napkin, the linen is a little heavier weight, so we will choose that dress weight linen. Having done that, it needs an answer for the type of design. If I move that over a little bit, you can then see that no, this is not a light, open design. So we're going to click on our drop-down and choose the other choice. It is indeed a solid, dense um, design. We have the question of shape. Yes, it is a closed shape. Are we going to hoop the fabric? Yes, we are. So at this point, we do a next. These are the three options that you have to apply to the design. You have total control over this. What parts would you like to work with? Do you want it to add new density? If we don't, we take out the check mark. Do we want additional underlay? If we don't, we take out the check mark, and so forth. So. This is the first time we're going through. If you're not sure, let's leave all those default choices. We will do an apply. A question comes up just reminding us, is this design created in C2S? Yes, it is. And now we have all three of those things applied to our design. We will click on Next. And here we have helpful suggestions um, about this particular design to be stitched on a linen napkin. It suggests a fusible tearaway. It also suggests a topper. Now remember, these are suggestions only. Um, you have the fabric right in front of you. You can decide how much stretch does this linen actually have. Does it need the fusible? You can decide how much texture the linen actually has, uh, whether or not we use a topper. But these are the helpful suggestions that the software is giving us to do this particular design on a linen napkin. Please notice that we have the ability to print, which is very helpful. We could print out these suggestions. If you don't have time to do your napkin right now, you could print out these suggestions. You could also print out the template of the design and pin both of those sheets of paper to your linen fabric so that you have all of your helpful tools with that fabric when you do have time to sit down and do the embroidery. Before we move on, let me direct your attention back up here to the stitch count. We have 6803. And as I click down here on Finish, it's going to automatically bring me into the box where it wants to save. I'm going to call this Heart Linen. I'll go ahead and save it. A couple things have happened here on the screen. I'll take you right back up here to the total number of stitches. It went from 6803 to 6881. Well, let's think about that for a moment. Why do we have more stitches? It might not seem logical, but if we were to compare the number of stitches to each individual area that we have here, the large 
heart, the medium hearts inside, and so forth, we would notice that it really changed all the underlay of each of these, and we can click back on satin and take a look, it has added a parallel underlay to all of those. Um, it also has added, if I click off my selected heart, we notice that it has added those suggestions that it gave us right here to our uh, notes, right part of this design. It's a very helpful thing to stay with this design. We can actually click within those notes and I could add additional additional information, perhaps um, linen napkins, Feb of 2015. And if I wanted to add more and say that it was for Aunt Mary and Uncle Bob, I certainly could do that as well. But that information is going to stay with this design. What if we were going to put this design on a guest towel? That's different fabric altogether. This time, let's go into our other heart. You may remember that we simply drag that up from the library. Um, the first thing I'm going to do while I remember is to ungroup it because when we drag up from our library, the design comes in groups, so I've taken care of that. We're going to go back to our feature of File, Click to Stitch. We go down this time and choose the appropriate fabric. Well, it's all the way down here at the bottom woven with nap. If we're talking about a guest towel that might be a nice velour uh, terry cloth, we want this last one. Once again, we need to change the type of design to a solid dense design. It does have a closed shape. We are not going to hoop the fabric. So even though this is a question, it also made this suggestion for us that with your working with velour where you could burn the nap of that um, or make a hoop mark that it is also telling us not to hoop the fabric. We will do a next. We have our three choices there. We're going to do an apply, say yes it was a C2S design, and do a next. Now look at these suggestions because this is a different type of fabric. It's suggesting maybe a fusible trico on the back for fabric prep or an ultralight uh, interfacing on the back. Once again, the towel will have a bit of stretch to it. It's also suggesting uh, an adhesive tearaway stabilizer because of the fact we're not going to be hooping it. And it gives us some added information, the finger press to secure and so forth, that will help you do that if you are new to this kind of design. Suggests the topper because of all of that nap on our towel. And look also at this additional choice that it offers us. If those of you that have a monster hoop, you know that you don't really have to use a uh, adhesive stabilizer with that and giving you suggestion on how to work with your monster hoop. Again, you have that option to print. We'll take a look, refresh our number of stitches is 6804. Come on down and click on finish. And this time we'll call it heart towel. Save that. And we come up and look that, remember our, our Original stitches, 6804, they have now gone all the way up to 8433. Again, we have an increase on our towel. Let's watch the slow redraw and see what has changed in this design. We see that the original manual tack down, but we see additional underlay right here, adding both vertical in both directions. Our um, Complex fill is stitching out as it were, and if I speed this up just a little bit to get to our inside hearts, we can see that there is quite a bit of underlay stitching going on in these hearts. You may remember before there was hardly any at all. So now we see a lot more of that underlay. It really wants to mat down the pile on that towel um, to do a very good job of stitching this design, making sure that all of the stitches stay above that nap or pile of the towel. We can see extra that was in our heart and arrow and take a look at how much extra is in this satin stitch as well. So we see that it really has beefed up. Um, in essence, it changed all of the underlay for all objects from nothing 
to a three part. Once again, we'll go back under our satin heart that we were used to seeing, and we see that it's added a contour, center line, and zigzag. Now, remember that in that one screen, you can control, if you don't want this extra underlay placed in there, you can take that check mark out of that. One other thing we're going to stop and do here, because this design, we have said we're going to put it on a towel, I want to maybe refresh some of you and introduce the rest of you to the idea of putting an auto based around this design. It's so very easy to do. We'll click on that. Oops, I'm sorry, we have to have the design selected. And I'll come up here and click on auto based. <clears throat> I can't see the whole thing on my Zoom. If you come over here on your Zoom and do a double click on that, it always brings you to a full screen. And we see that that auto base has been placed around the design um, by the measurement that I have set under general options. One of the things it does, the software will always put your auto base first in line to stitch out. So that will stitch out before any of the design. If you think about that, that makes perfect sense. If we have a topper, everything is all hooped up to go on our embroidery machine and we have a topper on there, instead of having to use straight pins to hold it down or keep our fingers sort of out of the way while we keep that topper there, this basting stitch is going to stitch out first and anchor that topper to the towel and then allow all of these other stitches to lay nicely on top of that. All right. <coughs> Excuse me. We have taken a look at the click to stitch and in doing so we spent a little bit extra time talking about the whys and wherefores of this particular feature. But let me show you that it really can be a very easy procedure. Um, I'm going to do an undo and take off the basting. I'm going to undo and put this design back to its original 6804. And we'll say one last time we were going to do this design on a uh, high quality cotton, a quilting cotton. So really this is how quickly this feature can be. We come back up to the file, click to stitch, go get our fabric. In this case it is a medium smooth woven for our cotton. We click on that, we change the design, we leave our boxes as is, we do a next, we leave all of the choices, we apply, say yes, next, we make note of the suggestions, we finish, we can name the design, I'll just cancel there, and truly in uh, less than a minute we have prepared this heart design to be stitched out on quality cotton. So it can be a very fast procedure. Okay, we'll pause there for a, mo uh, a moment. Dory, do we have any questions coming in about these first couple things that we're playing with? Yes, one of the questions is stabilizers. Can we talk a little bit about that in terms of do you use a topper and what kind of topper do you use? A water soluble or a heat away? When you are working in our example here of a velour, if I were going to use a topper, I'm going to use a wash away. Um, whenever you use a, uh, like a solvy is one of the names of a topper. Uh, we also have film is another name you might see used. But um, they differ from a water soluble stabilizer. The topper is usually a thinner fabric, a thinner, um, it's not tr truly vinyl, but it is a wash away um, type of fabric. And that's just going to lay right on top of your towel. And the reason we put a topper in, again, is to allow any stitches from the design to be stitched over that topper, and it keeps it on the top of the towel instead of having those stitches bury themselves in perhaps a thick velour or terry cloth. As far as the stabilizer underneath for the, um, the hooping stabilizer, as the recommendations were made, you could have, um, now I, I did some backup, so these are the information for the cotton, but you may remember for our towel, it suggested a adhesive stabilizer, and the reason it is doing that is because the towel itself is not being hooped, and the sticky stabilizer will adhere the towel to that until we do that basting stitch. 
So you do have some options there. Super. Thank you very much. And Nancy asked, when you do your stitching, do you do many backups of your stitching, of your design that you create? How many backups is a safe number? Uh, are you asking for the backup of the design in a um, purely from the computer aspect of it when I have when I create a design? Um, one of the things you want to be aware of is when you create a design, and we're going to talk about this uh, shortly about saving our design to stitch out on our machine. But I generally, um, when I'm playing with a design, and again, I have some things built in for later in the webinar so we can play with this design and save along the way. I have a tendency if I make a change to the design, I might uh, save it heart and if I know that I'm moving along my process and I'm not quite sure where I'm going, that I might call the first one heart one, the second one heart two, and so forth. And then when I get, I always know that my highest number is the last one that I was working with, and that chances are is the one that I'm going to stitch out. As far as backup, I do have um, an external hard drive that is a part of my laptop, so I will generally have this design saved on my laptop. Chances are I have transferred it to my USB drive, my flash drive, so that I can take it to my machine and stitch out. And then lastly, um, every so often, it depends on how active I have been in my creation process, um, maybe at the end of every week, beginning of another week, I might uh, transfer those designs, copy those designs back onto my external hard drive just for a safe backup. Super. And the last question I have for you for tonight, Michelle asked, could I run click to stitch and uncheck all the style boxes just to find out how to stabilize the design? Absolutely. That's a great question. And let's do that. Um, we will go ahead and undo. I'm going to undo and I put those stitches back to the original count. So at the moment, we, this is as if it were our original design. Let's go under File, click to Stitch, put it on. Uh, once again, we'll just go ahead and use our Terry. And it is a thick design, a dense design. We'll say Next. Your question was, what if we simply remove all check marks? We certainly can do that. Apply it, say yes, go to next, and here we have just our suggestions on how to hoop and stabilize that particular design. If I finish it, and I'm just going to leave it at heart towel, we'll um, uh, save it there. Yes, I already have one, we'll replace it, and then I could save this, I have saved this design with my suggestions right here in my notes box. Great question. We certainly can do that. If you have digitized this and you know it's exactly the way you want it to stitch out, then you do not have to alter it in any way, but have your helpful notes here as a part of that design. Great question. Okay, if uh, we have no more questions at this moment, we'll nope. go ahead and move forward. Um, Let's remember that up to now we have worked with only a C2S format, which is the native format. I'm going to, I'm actually going to close this design because we made changes to it. I'm not going to save that. Go back and do a file, open, bring my heart back in. We see our other two that we've saved as linen and towel. I'll bring the original back up turn on my 3D so you can see how pretty it is. But we talk about the C2S format as being the native format of Perfect Embroidery Pro. What does that mean, native format? Well, think of the word native. It means born in a particular place or country. She is a native of Pennsylvania. So in essence, your design was born or created right here in Perfect Embroidery Pro. When it is saved as a C2S format, it saves all of the code that is necessary to stitch out this design. It saves stitch type, font, thread color, stitch length, density, all of that. But the beauty of this C2S format is all of that code information is 100% um, editing 
capability. We can go in at any time in the future and change anything about this design that we would like to do. Think of this as your working file. However, we know that we cannot take this C2S file to our machine and stitch it out. We have to save it in the appropriate machine format. So we come up here to File, we come down here to Save As, and right here as Save As Type, the default of course is for our C2S, our Inspiration Series format. We're going to click on our drop down menu and we see all of the choices that we have to save. And should you want to scroll down, you would see other types of um, saving formats as well. For right now, we're concerned with machines. I'm going to come up and choose the baby lock, um, and it comes and gives me the PES format. I do a save, and that design has been saved. But it does not open that design for us. We are still in that C2S heart. If I wanted to take a look at the PES that I have just saved, I'm going to click up here. Now, uh, some of you may or may not know that if I click up here on File, certainly I could go to Open, where I just opened this heart design, but the last four designs that you have worked with will be listed down here at the bottom. So it's a shortcut way for you to go to a particular design if it's one of the last four that you've played with. So I'm going to click on the PES version of that, turn on my 3D so that you can see it. Um, a little difference in the colors right here. This is our P my PES uh, design and back here is my C2S design and they are different. But if you are saving to your machine format, you always want to start with your C2S design. What if I own two different embroidery machines? Perhaps I own a baby lock which uses the PES format and perhaps I have a FOF. So in this case, you always want to go back to your original C2S working file and from that design, go back under File, Save As, find the additional machine format that you need. I'm going to come down here to uh, FOF and we'll go ahead and save that. Once again, it does not open it for me automatically, so I'll come up here to File, come down here to the FOF format, and it opens this design. Turn on my 3D so you can see it. And once again, I now have my C2S file, my PES file, my FOF file, everything ready for the specific machine that it needs. Um, that's what actually happens when you save your C2S under a different machine format. It changes the code necessary for that particular machine to read and understand what's going on. I'm going to um, do a little experiment. Okay, I have created a file already. We're going to do our file open, and it is a uh, nothing special, but it is a file whereby I have created two hearts. This blue one, as you see, is just a normal complex fill. The tatami is there, and if I were to click on the red one, you see that it has a motif fill um, with just the, the number 100 motif. Very simple, but it's going to show you something. This is my C2S format. If I come up here and once again come down to Save It As, and change it to my machine format, ready to stitch. I'm going to go back under my baby lock, uh, call it two hearts with my PES format. Once again, it does not open it for me, so I'm going to go back up here to File, come down to two hearts PES, and I open that design. Again, turn on the 3D for you. You can see a slightly different color on this particular thread in the PES, but what I want to show you, if we go back to the original two hearts that was created here in Perfect Embroidery Pro, it has the C2S format, at any point in the future, I can come into this design and make changes to it. If I were going to click on my drop down for fill type, come down to stippling, ask it to apply, it changes that heart to stippling. Okay? If I come over here to my PES file, I click on that heart. If I think to change it to stippling, I come over here to fill type, click on my drop down, and I see 
that I do not have all six or seven options that I do when I'm in my C2S format. So once this has been saved in my PES or any machine format, I am limited as to the amount of um, editing that I might even be allowed to do, okay, or not allowed to do. You see that choice is not even there. If I come back to my C2S, we know that I've changed this stippling. I could click on this heart. It selects the whole heart. I can go back into my motifs, and I can change um, that motif and apply that motif to give myself a different look. Remember, this is the original C2S design. If I come into the PEZ that is saved in the machine format, and I go to click on the motif heart, right off the bat, we see something different. I do not have the whole heart selected. It simply selected a portion of the heart that it has divided into run stitch. If I were to move down a little bit, can you see all of the individual run areas of the design? It is not treating the heart as a full design. Now, this does not mean it's going to stitch out oddly on my baby lock machine. It's going to stitch out exactly as it looks here. What this is showing us is if I ever try to bring up my PEZ design and make changes to it, I'm uh, notice that it doesn't even treat this as a motif fill, but just a standard. And if I were to go under motif and make my choice, um, I'll go ahead and click on this one and apply it. Do you see that what it does instead, you may remember all of those run stitches here, that it's treating each part of those bars going across and filling the motif with just those bars. So that is absolutely not what I would want for this design. We'll go ahead and do an undo to put that back the way it was. Um, but this is to show you that the beauty of you creating a native design in Perfect Embroidery Pro is from this point forward, I can make those changes um, anytime I wish to come in here and edit the original C2S design. Now, at this point, if I've made my stipple and my motif changes, let's go back up here and we'll come down and do a save as, and I change this to my FOF machine. I can click on that, save the design, and then if I go to open the two hearts saved as FOF with those changes, it does show me those changes. It will stitch out exactly as my original C2S um, was designed, but once again, it is just the editing capabilities that I do not have in a machine format itself. Okay, so trying to show you um, why we always want to start with a C2S design when we are then going to specific machine formats. One other thing that I'll show you is um, if any of you have ever worked with a design that is a DST design. And if I open my shopping lady, that is my C2S, oops, I didn't want to do that. Um, I will select all of her and Oops, let me get this out of the way here. <laughs> Select all of her and group her together. And then if I go back to my library, I have I have saved her also as a DST format. If any of you have ever seen designs that um, you receive and they look like this, this is a DST format. You can see that I saved the shopping lady as DST. We always get oddity in color in our DST. Um, the reason for that is because a DST is a commercial format and it does not recognize all the pretty colors that are assigned into the design. Rather, it just assigns color stops. So it will stop, allow you to change that and so forth, but it doesn't care about um, the logic of what it is doing. It actually assigns colors to the design based on the RGB color value, and it simply goes down the list, whatever might be next in the list. And that's why you sometimes get 
orange faces, yellow lips, blue hair when you have a DST format. Okay, we'll stop there for a moment. Dory, any other questions coming in? No, you have just blown away, at least me. Um, it's unbelievable what you did. When I changed the design colors in the DST, Chris wants to know, does it keep the colors? And what other formats don't keep colors? Um, I, I would have to play with the EXP. Um, I don't know that right off the bat if that's true. I, I do know the DST. Most of the other machine formats will keep the color value as close to it as it can. You may remember when we took a look at the heart, if we take a look at those two hearts and I put that back to a, a solid uh, blue fill stitch, you see that this color blue is a little different than when I saved it in my PEZ design. This is a little different blue. So it, what it does is um, each machine format has a different set of color codes. Some machines have more, some have less, um, and it just depends on how many colors they have available as when it goes down and assigns the color from your original design into whatever machine format you are changing. So you might see slight differences in color assigning, but um, the DST is, is I say notorious for that because it's so in our face that these are not the appropriate colors for the design. But once again, a DST or commercial format has no assigned colors. It simply assigns color stops to it. Um, so as it meanders down the RGB, and that stands for red, green, blue color value list, um, it simply takes the very next color in line whether it is logical or not. If I change those colors, first I need to ungroup her because I've dragged her in. But if I come to my sequence view and move towards the bottom, if I want to change her orange skin to something more applicable, I could do that. And now if I save this design, um, even as, um, well, let's just try that. I'll come down here and do a save as. I'm going to save both of these. I'll put Shopping Ladies 2 save that as our DST, and I need to find that where it might be. Oops, right at the very bottom, and we save that. And then if I go back and open my uh, Shopping Lady 2 again, you can see whoever had that great question, if I change my DST formats, remember that in this one we changed her skin to something a little uh, better than orange, but once I saved this file again as DST, you can see that nope, it does not care. Logic is not brought into this at all. It simply assigns those color stops. It will stop and allow us to change the color, but it does not save the color as we indicated. So a great question and a, a very fast experiment gave us the answer to that question. Super, then that means that the DST and EXP, which are the only commercial formats that I'm aware of, mm -hmm. they would be the only ones that would act like this. I, I'm going to agree with you. They're going to give us the weird hmm. uh, color schemes. Um, so ideally, you could make changes to the design in color and uh, save it to your C2S, and then later, whatever specific machine format you needed, you could change it to that specific format and the colors would stay. Super. Thank you so much. You're so welcome. I find it helpful to understand the why uh, in the um, future webinars that we all do together. I will do that a lot. Um, I like to explain the why of something because I feel that if you know how it was done in the first place and you understand that, then you can begin to tweak the designs to make them a little bit more yours if you understand how it was done in the first place. Okay. All and right. Thank you very much. I got one last question for you. Certainly. Do you have any new tricks up your sleeve that you are aware of that you could share? 
I am going to, uh, a great question, great timing. At this point, we're going to move away from some of this serious stuff and start to play a little bit more. Uh, give me a moment to clean some of these things off my screen. Um, and we are going to bring up that original heart. Again, it is Valentine's Day coming up, and I thought it would be fun for us to play with the heart. Uh, Let's we'll close our towel as well. And this is our original heart design. Just as a refresher, you may remember that we, you all have this design. It's a free heart um, coming to you with the Perfect Embroidery Pro free designs folder. All right, we are going to play here. Why do I need software? What can I do with my software? I hear these questions so often. In fact, Eileen answered the same question not uh, very long ago on her blog. And I want to show you some of the reasons why you want software. Um, sometimes need has nothing to do with it. It's just the pure joy of wanting. Here we begin with our heart. It's free. We're going to take this free design and make many other free designs from this original one. The first thing I want to do is come over here in our sequence view and I'm going to select the last three colors. So I'll click on the first one, hold down the control key on my keyboard, click the second and the third. The last three designs or uh, color stops in there and on my keyboard I'm hitting the delete key and I have just removed the arrow so at this point if I do a file save as and call it heart only I have my second design. So right off the bat, by removing some things in there, I have another design. If you look at this and you think, well, okay, but I really liked the satin stitch that was surrounding the heart, we can put that back. So I'll come under here and I will select the red heart, the big red heart. I'm going to right click inside the selection come down to create outline. The default is have it be distanced 0.08 away from the original selection. I'm going to change that to zero, meaning that this outline is going to rest exactly on the shape of the heart. I will say OK. I know it is there. We see it right over here. It is uh, the same color. So I'm going to come down here on my thread bar. You have many options on how to change that color. But one of my favorites is just to simply come down here and rest on the color I want, and I'm going to right click on that color. You see right over here, it's changed it to color number seven. While it's still selected, we're going to do a right click, convert to steel, and very quickly, that outline is back. So I could save this design, so it could be my heart with the satin outline. If I wanted to um, remove those three inner hearts, I'm going to come over here and select, hold down my control key, select those three inner hearts. I bring my mouse over, do a right click inside the selection, come up here and do a cut. A cut means it's going to take it off the heart totally. Bring myself up a clean design screen. Right click paste. And I have brought those three inner hearts over here to a clean screen. I'll turn on my 3D. And at this point, I'm going to take just a moment because I've played with this so often. I'm going, I know that these need to be grouped. So I will right click and group each one of those hearts because in just a moment, I'm going to move them around. Okay, we can take this, um, the large heart, and click on it and drag it down. I can take the center heart and move it up. And if I take a look at that design, I could actually save this design right now, and that would give me my third or fourth separate heart design from our original. I could start to play here. 
um, this is the fun part. This is why I love software, because it's so easy to play. We are visual people. What if, what if, what if? And we can continue to do all different kinds of things with this design and save along the way when I hit upon something that I really like. Perhaps I want to see what it looks like to drag the little heart in there to have the big one out here. So I could continue to play with these three, saving along the way for multiple designs. If I come back to our original heart, we now have removed the, the center hearts. I could save again and have just this heart with nothing in the middle and the outline to it. I could come up here and click on my text, click in here. Oops, that color is not quite what I was after. Um, I'm going to come up here and, oops, I'm sorry, I'm trying to get something out of my way here on the screen, and click under Circus. I know that I really like the Isidore font, so I'll come here and look for her alphabetically, click on my Isidore, apply, bring that letter A. It just so happens that that is my last name, Artinas. Make that a yellow. Uh, oops, I kind of like the yellow I have. I do a right click. And if I would like to size that down just a bit to fit within my heart, I can do that. And if I save right here, I now have a personalized heart. Um, certainly I could remove that A and I could type in a fun phrase. Some of the phrases that you see on the Valentine candy hearts. Uh, too cute, be mine, uh, forever, whatever thing little message that we want to type in with our heart. One of the things that I would strongly encourage you all to do when you are learning your software, or even those of you that considered intermediate advanced, there's always something that we don't know about the software, something else that we can learn. If I go over here and I select my steel stitch, and I come up here to properties with the different tabs, I'm going to click on the column tab, and here is a feature that you might not be aware of. It's jagged type. If you don't know what that means, let's play. Click on the drop down and choose both. I'm going to apply it to see what it does to my heart. Well, I saw just a little bit of change on the edges of that uh, steel stitch. So very often, if I don't know what something's going to do, I very much exaggerate the measurement. The default value for this is 0.1 millimeter. I'm going to change that to be a 3. I do an apply, and I can see, oh, well, that indeed is a jagged steel, jagged on both edges, and it can be kind of fun. I think we'll soften it just a little bit by changing the color, and we see that here we have a different heart. If I go further and delete the letter A, I now have a different heart design that I could save. Once again, add more text to if I chose to do that, but I have a different look from my original heart. So here, don't be afraid to go into the properties. If you don't understand what something is, play with it, exaggerate the number, apply, and maybe you won't like it. I think this is kind of funky, so I do like the look. If I want to come over here, I know that that part of the design is still selected. If I right-click within the selection, come down to Copy, I'm going to go over to our other design screen and do a paste because now I've given myself a fourth heart to play with in all of these funky little designs. So I could place all of these hearts wherever I'd like to around the screen and continue to play and place them until I see something that strikes my fancy and I want to stop at that moment to save that design. So that's one way that I encourage you to play. You take an, an existing design and simply start taking it apart, taking pieces, paste them into a different screen, see what you have to play with. Okay, strongly encourage that. We're going to play a little bit more. I just brought up a clean design screen, and this time we're going to go with our buttonhole. We click on buttonhole. This is one of the new features of the, of the download. We click and create buttonholes. Notice the mouse, it's still in a creation mode. I can do the repeats of buttonholes all around the screen. 
to stop the repetition, come over here, click on your select, and I'm just going to delete those extra ones that I put in and take a look at the original that we put on the screen. We do a 3D to see how pretty it is. Come over here and look at the properties. By default, it is one inch high. I can do a uh, select and I could change that to a two inch or a three inch just depending on whatever size buttonhole I want to use. I very much like this feature. I have a number of the covered buttons that are two and a half inch diameter so I could come over here and make a three inch buttonhole that would be very lovely for that. We'll put that back to one. Apply it and something else that you can do with the buttonhole if you come up here to your repeat I can come in and say that I want six buttonholes for the number across, I want one number down, I want one inch between all of them, click on apply, come out to my original screen, if I bring this down a little bit to 100 so you can see better, but what I have done with just two clicks, I brought a buttonhole on my screen and I came up here to the repeat, I have created a row of evenly spaced same size buttonholes across an area. What can we do with that? On the back of a little uh, girl's or boy's jacket, you could take some ribbon and weave through those open buttonholes, cording, what elastic, uh, they have such fun colored elastic on the market now. So a very fast way to do a little um, trick to an existing uh, uh, clothing or um, if you're making from scratch. Okay, Dory, do we have just a few more minutes? I want to bring them back to uh, the project that we were going to play with. We have about three with minutes. Our buttons. Okay, let me take everyone through that. I did promise you this. I have a picture here. This I saw in the latest issue of HGTV magazine. It was on one of the pages to do fun little projects. It's done out of felt. Something else I would strongly encourage you to do is take a look at your magazines. Look everywhere. Inspiration is everywhere. I looked at this and said, it's darling. How can I do that in my embroidery software? I come back into Perfect Embroidery Pro. In my clean screen, I decide what size I want that felt tray. So I'm going to come up here, choose a rectangle, hold down my control key, and draw a square in the drawing, come up here to my size. My, I'm going to be using my 8 inch hoop, so I'm going to make this an 8 inch square. I'll apply that. I can't see it until I double click on my uh, magnifying glass. And I'm going to right click, convert it to a run. I very much like a bean stitch, so we'll I will apply the bean stitch. Three repeats will be enough for us on this felt. So that di design is selected. And I'm going to copy it, paste it, come down here, right click on a different color so we can see it easily, come over here into my size. And what I'm doing here is creating an, inter an inside square that will give us a fold line. If I want the lip of my tray to be one and a half inches high, I'm going to subtract three inches from that width and make this a five inch square, apply it, and we see that it is inside my square. If I take my buttonhole and I click over here to create my buttonhole, I am going to um, zoom in here so that you can see what we're doing. Put that in a 3D mode and get my select. I'm going to ch change that buttonhole into a different color so you can see it easily. I want these buttonholes to be part of the felt tray. Instead of using, they used snaps. We are going to use buttonholes because of this wonderful new feature. Here's my buttonhole selected. I come up here to rotate left, click it once, drag it into position. Now I could copy and paste and drag that design right over to the other side here. Very quickly, if I want this to be more accurate, I'm going to create myself a um, line that goes from the top corner here to the top of my fold line. 
I right click to end it, pick my select, I'm going to change the color of that as well to purple, and then also get my pen tool again, and I'm just going to draw a straight line. If I watch this marker right over here on my ruler, and I click on a line, come over, and before I click again, make sure that that is straight, right click to end it, select it, turn it into my purple, I am going to rotate it one time, bring it so that it marks on my line. I can take this one buttonhole and abut the top, bring up abut the second one, bring over my ruler to make the distance here. I see that my distance from here to my buttonhole is 14. If I check the other one, I see that I'm 17, so I'm a little off. I'm going to select it move over just a hair, and that then will be placement. I do it correctly in one corner. I'm going to um, zoom out a bit, and then I'm going to take my select key and select all of those. The two artwork lines that I use for placement, the double buttonholes, right-click group. Now they're all together. I'm going to right-click copy, right-click paste, drag that second one down a bit, I'm going to rotate, rotate, drag it up to my corner. Do you see what we're doing with our artwork lines now? I've made that very easy for me to place it right in the corner. Do a right click, paste again, drag this one down, do a rotate, 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 and bring that to my bottom corner, allowing those artwork lines for placement. Do a paste again, rotate once, twice, drag that one down to my bottom corner, and we have created this felt box, and I'll go forward to show you that this is the one that we do on our embroidery. You see that here are the buttonholes, and I took ribbon, simply put them between the two buttonholes, tied my knot on top so that it draws the two sides together, and we have that inside square as our fold line, so here we have a felt box. Very quickly, if you are going to do this project, we are going to, um, you want craft felt. It doesn't have to be the $20 yard wool felt, but you don't want the very inexpensive 99 cent squares that you can see through either. Ideally, one piece is a stiff craft felt. If you can't find that, use a Pellon Deco Bond or Craft Fuse interfacing on the wrong side of one of the pieces. Cut two squares larger than your finished size. In this case, we made ours 8 inches, so I would cut two 9 inch squares. Prepare the regular craft felt with a piece of two-sided fusible web like heat and bond or steam seam light. Fuse both pieces together, being careful of the hot iron on the felt. You might want a pressing cloth. Hoop tear away in your appropriate size hoop. Lay the fused square over the hoop. It should cover the whole embroidery field with the inside of the tray facing down. So in this case, the aqua felt was facing down. Stitch out the first square, which is our outside here. You stitch the remaining inside square and all of the buttonholes. Remove from the hoop. Trim about a quarter inch away from your bean stitch. You could even use a wave blade in your embroidery cutter. Open up your buttonholes carefully and then string in your ribbon or cording or pieces of suede to um, tie together to bring those, cor those uh, corners up nicely to create our tray. And then the last thing is for you to use this somewhere in your sewing room. Questions, Dory? No, no more questions. We do have to leave. However, I cannot begin to thank you how much um, I have enjoyed this webinar. It is wonderful to have you exposed from our family <laughs> and thank you again thank you all for allowing me into your homes this evening hope you'll join me again february 17th when we play with text good night good night all